We have uh, a family that's been in our church uh, quite a long time, and they've never needed help, never asked for help, but this situation is a little unusual, and uh, I would love to do a dollar blessing to bless them. I'm not free to tell you the situation, but if you knew it, you'd be very generous, and I'm just going to ask you to trust me. That's all I know how to do that. And for you visiting, uh, you don't need to do this, but people in our church sometimes will help them. Put a dollar, a ten, or twenty, whatever you've got, a five. Uh, if you don't have anything, I understand sometimes I'm without cash. But uh, if we could pass that down and let's do a blessing for this family, I'd appreciate it. Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5. I've been talking on the Holy Spirit. This is the last of these messages. Matthew chapter 5, and verse number uh, 6, I want you to actually look at those words and use your smartphone or something to just Google that, you can bring it up too. Uh, uh, We've established the fact uh, that uh, the Holy Spirit is about the power to be upon us and in us to achieve a task that is God's will. That's the number one thing that the Holy Spirit is for. That we might have power to be witnesses everywhere and around the world, everywhere we are, everything we do. But the Holy Spirit has many things. First, let me remind you, we talked about that the Holy Spirit is the third person of God. He is a person, not a vague presence. Uh, He is God on earth and in us. In 1 Corinthians 12, we're told that every one of us have been baptized into the body of Christ by the Spirit of God. In other words, we're born of the Spirit. We're regenerated by the Spirit. We also are told that in the Old Testament how God's Spirit would come upon people and anoint them for a task. We have been told uh, and looked at the fact that there is uh, something that happened uh, recorded in Acts 2 where Jesus baptized people in the power of the Spirit, and uh, at least several times throughout, there were things that happened there that were miraculous, anything from a mighty wind, rushing wind, and uh, cloven tongues, and all kinds of stuff, and implications that uh, talked about boldness, and and, and uh, quickening, and all that kind of thing, and spiritual language that happened. Um, but I did tell you that while spiritual language is a a great benefit to all of us that we can pray and we can worship in a way that we otherwise couldn't, that I did tell you that don't get caught up in looking and seeking a language, but look and seek God because His Spirit wants to fill you. And what's most important is that it quickens and illuminates the Word. It quickens and helps you worship God in spirit and truth as John 4, 24 tells us to do, that the Holy Spirit... um, uh, uh, pours into in our life that we would bear by in a natural way his fruit and that fruit being love that we would love believers and we would love unbelievers that we would love one another and prefer one another and be kind to each other the Holy Spirit fruits are many and uh, that is the power of God that not only will our words be a witness but our lives bear fruit that that, that witness might have power And so, do you need God's Spirit in a great way? Yes, Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father. The Father's on the throne and the Holy Spirit He's sent. And He said, it's good that I go away because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit won't come. And while in theology, if you want to make the issue, I get it and I agree with you that God is one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but one in three persons. And so, in essence, they are all with us by His Spirit. He's there among us. They're everywhere. They see everything. They know everything. They have all power, and it, this resides in us. And God, we've looked at the gifts of God, that God wants to achieve tasks through you, that God's Spirit will work through you for the purpose of building up the body, edifying the body, and also winning the lost. God's Spirit is real, folks. And today, we come to the conclusion, and the conclusion is at the end of my challenge, which is not so much a teaching, but a challenge that we go after God. 
that we seek God, that we hunger for God, that we thirst for God, as King David of old did on a regular basis, as every those of us are urged to do in Scripture, even by Jesus himself, starting in Matthew 5, which is the beginning of his great recorded uh, sermon on the mount in, in Matthew 5, verse 6, where uh, it's recorded, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The message is hungry and thirsty. My daughter tells me at times, I'm hangry. Anybody ever heard that phrase, hangry? You're so hungry, you're getting angry. <laughs> you're getting irritable, uh, and uh, it, it can happen to the best of us. Um, and if you look at that, the word hunger, I mean, when you're hungry, you're going to do what you can to get what you need to fill you, the bread of life. When you're thirsty, there's nothing like thirst that you want to quench it no matter what. And uh, guys, that's what God is asking us, that if you want to be filled, you need to hunger for it, for God, a thirst for God. And in Matthew 6, 33, 34, it says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. This is in the context of, of, uh, of, of Jesus, again, in his Sermon on the Mount, saying, don't worry about what you will eat or what you will wear or where you will live for shelter. Those are the basics. He said, don't even worry about that. Make your pursuit God. Seek God, hunger for God, thirst for God and his kingdom and his righteousness. Make that your desire. Well, today, unfortunately, we don't have to really worry too much, most of us, about where we're going to live or where, or you got clothes you need to get out of your closet that no longer fit and take them down to the shelter. That, I would, that was meddling a little bit. Uh, you don't have to worry about what you're going to eat. Our distractions isn't worrying for the cares of this world for the basics. No, it's the pleasures of the world. Where Paul writes to Timothy that in the last days perilous times will come and men will be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God, proud and blasphemers, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. We go after everything for enjoyment. It's enjoyment. It's entertainment. It's uh, to get away, to refresh. And it's all a secular refreshing, a secular refilling, a secular sort of enjoyment to try to, to break up and get our minds off of the struggles of this world. And, and so today I want to urge you to hunger and thirst. In Ephesians 5.18 says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit. And I want you to know that there's a, a Spirit thing that Jesus does that's miraculous and powerful, but there's a thing that you do on a daily basis through discipline where you're pouring into your manhood, your soul, you're pouring spirit stuff, it's disciplines, you're feeding on the word, you're meditating on the word, you're memorizing the word, you're spending time listening to God, you're spending time worshiping God, spending time with God, and that will fill you up with God. The great evangelist D.L. Moody was asked why he placed so much emphasis on being continually filled up with the Holy Spirit, and he said, because I leak. You leak. Dr. Nunley said the same thing the last time he was here. He said, we leak and we need that continuous, be ye continuously full of his spirit. Have you been leaking? Point one, are you spiritually dry? Well, I hope you pray like King David did. He's in the midst of an arid land. I've been there in Israel. The ground is arid. There's not much water there. And evidently, it must have been a dry time. And when Psalm 63, verse 1, was recorded, when he prayed, You, God, are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there's no water. He's drawing a parallel between the physical around him and the heart condition, the spiritual thing of, God, I want you. You're my God. I need you. I thirst. I seek you earnestly. And perhaps 
the reason that God says that David's a man after his own heart because of prayers like that. You know, Psalms isn't meant to establish theology. While it may back up theology, Psalms is poetry and many times expression of the individual writing and crying out to God. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me. See if there be any wicked way in me. Prayers and words of praise and seeking God, many of, many of them. So how do you know when you're spiritually dry? Well, one, one thing assigned is you're serving out of duty while you're empty. You're serving out of duty while you're empty. And we're no longer ministering to others out of a sense of the fullness of God. We feel empty, we feel weary, our inner tank is dry, running dry. And when you're running dry, there's a subtle shift in your motivation of why you do what you do in your ministry, the way you serve God. Whether it's in the church or elsewhere, your motivation is suddenly shifted. We're no longer motivated by passion and by the Spirit and by intrinsic uh, call of God and purpose of God. We feel an inner reluctance to serve, a resistance to serve, but we continue to do so because we maybe we feel we have no choice. We've lost our joy in serving. Our motivation to continue serving may be that others are relying on us or we want to honor a commitment or maybe we just feel a duty towards the church or toward God or toward his calling so we keep going. I've been there. I've been dry. It's something that we all probably, if we're honest, we all need a little watering today of his Holy Spirit. To close the service, I'm gonna ask you to move, man, go after God. To come to these altars, to move and just go after God. To close your eyes, to shut off the physical and go after that thing, the things which you cannot see or touch, and go after God. And ask him to come and reign upon you and raise up within you and strengthen you and refresh you, and he can do that. He can do that in a moment and begin a journey back to a closeness, a close walk. Was there ever a time in your life when you were closer to God than you are now? If so, you've slid back from that closeness and you need to slide back forward into relationship in a closer way with God. Not only do we see that we're serving uh, uh, empty and out of duty, but we lose our witness when we're spiritually dry. You see, it affects our relationship with others around us. We may have intellectual information and we may believe things in our head, but we've lost our joy. There's no bubbling over. There's no glow of his spirit. There's no countenance of the Lord upon us. We're no longer contagious. Our light is dimming. Our fire, our fire is, is, is being quenched. And our salt is losing some of its saltiness and people aren't seeing what they used to see. They're not seeing something that makes them want to thirst for God anymore. And we've lost motivation to share Jesus with them. We've lost that motivation, nor, and we feel like maybe we have nothing to offer. VBS is for minister to our kids, but in particular this one is to reach kids. Ask yourself, are you teaching your children to reach out to their friends that are unchurched to bring them to something fun where they can hear about Jesus and then inviting the family next Sunday morning to come to this place to receive God's grace and love? Are your children being taught about knowing Jesus, knowing scripture, knowing how to pray, knowing how to witness your grandchildren? I regret, both for my daughter and my son, that I poured more into them to develop them with other skills and less about God. If I had spent as much time pouring into my children as I did making sure Austin knew how to pitch, catch a ball, throw a ball, and hit a ball, it'd be, I'd be happier today. And trust me, I will not make that mistake with my grandchildren. There's something that doesn't fade and that never ends. It's eternal, it's invisible, it's powerful. And we need to be mindful that witness is what it's about, folks. Everything comes back to go into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching them to observe all things that whatsoever I command you to observe, to learn, teach. We lose our witness when we are spiritually dry, we're empty. We don't spend, the next thing, we don't spend time alone with God. You know you're spiritually dry. 
There's no excitement about our relationship with God. Our devotional life has gotten rather stale. It's kind of routine. We look at it. It's all intellectual. There's no move. We just get it done and get it out of there. Or maybe we don't do it as often, or maybe it's totally dead. There is no devotional life anymore. No more reading the Bible. No more time alone with God. No more praying. We love God still in our hearts and minds maybe, but we've lost that first love, that zeal. We're lukewarm at best. Our relationship with God is not fresh. It's, it's not, we're not abiding with Christ. And this dryness, this spiritual state of dryness can happen to us gradually. Too many irons in the fire, too much going here and going there and not enough time for God. Too many trying to, trying to uh, 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 give our kids every opportunity this world opposite. I mean, 10 sports, 15 dance teams, and you name it, they're all a part of everything, but no time for God. So our relationship grows stale. Worldly things become too important to us. Sometimes this can happen to us also with a sudden trial or disaster that happens, and suddenly it just affects our relationship with God. You lose a spouse, you lose a son or a daughter, you lose a brother or sister or a mother or a father. There's some tragedy that happens, and that's when some of you, by the Spirit, need to be used of God to come alongside, take their hand, pick them up, help them, walk them through it, pray with them, and, and minister to them. That's all important. So, you know, just stay with me because right now you're probably feeling like maybe a little guilt, but when, you, when I get done, I'm going to help you, okay? The next thing that, see, you're dry, you don't spend time alone with God is we're critical, we're negative. You know that. You analyze and evaluate everything and everybody and instead of enjoying everything and everybody. We aren't enjoying life. We're unhappy. We're negative. We lost our love for people. The people we know, we've lost that love for. The people we don't know. We don't care about the lost. In fact, we don't really even like ourselves. You know, when I had the Holy Spirit full in me when I was young, I remember looking at old people that smelled and they weren't well kept and all that, and all I could feel was love, was unbelievable love. And I remember thinking, this must be how God looks at people because he looks at them through the blood of Jesus Christ, and he sees you, the righteousness of Christ, and he loves you. He's not sitting there thinking about this problem, you're having that problem, and you're struggling with that. He's wanting to walk with you, and he'll help you with that. It's like, why would you, if your son or daughter was having a problem, would you come along and you just focus on their negative, you just pick on them and critical and negative and beat them up and beat them up and beat them up? He said, no, come sit on my lap. Let's go together. Let's walk together. Let me show you how to do that. I love you. This isn't hard. Just be with me. Just come on. Let's take some time and be with me. Otherwise, a sign is that we can be critical and negative that we're a little dry. And the next thing is that God is silent and prayer is so difficult when you're spiritually dry. God is silent, prayer is difficult. Well, there is an answer, number two, to spiritual dryness. And the answer comes in John 15, 5, and I'm not doing the textual thing here because I'm doing mainly a challenge to wrap this up to say we need to come and enjoy the presence of God and find it and walk in it. He says, I am the vine, Jesus said, and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. That's what God wants, fruit. Fruit, you'll know them by their fruit. Holy Spirit, Fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't do anything apart from God. John 15, 5. See, God intended us to rely on him con continuously all the time that he would flow through us by his spirit, come to us and flow through us and out of us, that we can abide with him. And to do that, we must hunger and live a life of hungering and thirsting, seeking and, uh, and after God and his kingdom. See, the first thing we need to do to overcome dryness is repent of sin. Repent of sin because sin blocks our relationship with God. And if you'll listen, if there's anything between you and God, he will bring it to you. He will lovingly. And we come, we're dry, we're weary, and he points out some sin he wants you to deal with, and he does it lovingly, the desire to help you, forgive you, pick you up. But he confronts sin because it hurts you and other people. Greed, lust, pride, jealousy, envy, bitterness, unforgiveness, hatred, and on I could go. He hates that because it hurts you, it hurts others. And he wants to help us. That's why he walks with us. He doesn't say, do, you know, all these sins are bad. Now, don't do them. No, he says, 
Come, let's abide, and I will walk with you and help you be over an overcomer. I will be there. I'm going to walk this thing out with you. See, God loves people. He loves you. And, and, and we need to listen to him because he knows what's best. And he knows your sins are hurting you. And he knows probably you want to be free from them. And he wants you to know he wants to forgive you. He's running to you. If you need Jesus to forgive you of anything, he will forgive you this day if you'll only but ask. He promised to. God wants to be close to you. He wants to talk with you and walk with you and be in your life all day long. But we have to first repent of sin if we know it, turn from it, ask God to help us and walk with us and pursue God's kingdom. As the Lord taught us to pray, may his kingdom come, his will be done. May God's kingdom come. You see, we will never be filled with God when we're filled with self and sin. He will lovingly confront us and he'll offer us forgiveness. If we'll repent of our sins, we'll have a great relationship there. Second, secondly, you know, the next thing is we need to take responsibility for our spiritual lives if, to overcome dryness. We, you know, we're working hard, we're serving, we're ministering in some capacity. It's easy to blame others or circumstances for our dryness. We place responsibility for our depletion upon our business, our circumstances, or on other people. And know that we're the ones. We can do something about this. God is, you don't need anybody to go through. God is right there. We can do something about our spiritual dominance. Take time. It's time to take ownership of our spiritual condition and our relationship with God. We need to do whatever it takes to make time for God. Read the word, to have private prayer and private worship. Take responsibility. The next thing is to keep your eyes on Jesus and not man or anything else. You see, it's too easy to work to focus on the work of God and not God of the work. Listen to me. It's too easy to focus on the gifts of God and not the God of the gifts. Focus on Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. Keep your eyes on the Lord. He's the one we need. And, and, and it's easy even to fall in the trap of looking at what we do for God instead of keeping our mind on what the Lord has done for us. Another thing that can happen is we can look to man and make it all about the evangelist or the preacher or the singer or whoever else. See, God's not going to share his glory with anybody else. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 makes it clear that no flesh would boast, that no other person have glory. The glory is all about Jesus. It's not about man. It's not ever about us or how talented we are. The move of God's spirit depends on our hearts being open and seeking him and never depends on another person being so great. But you'll see people manipulated because people are looking to people. That's why these people on TV get so much money because we think they somehow done something for us, through us, or whatever. So we ship our money off somewhere, and it's a waste, and they're, drive, they're flying big jets and living like kings and queens and making up excuses. This is not a man-centered faith. This is Jesus-centered. And his spirit will, doesn't even speak of himself. He always speaks of Jesus. And everything God tells him, the Holy Spirit will tell you, reveal to you, it's about Jesus. It's about God, not us. Keep your eyes on Jesus. The next thing is to take time to seek hunger and thirst. To overcome this dryness, we need to hunger and thirst and seek him, and we need time. We need intimacy with God, a fresh infilling. I, I, I do, you do, we do. Our need is for God himself. A sermon and a song isn't going to do it. we got to go after God. It's not going to fill you. It may be a means to help you. I hope this one does. I'm not really teaching anything deep. I'm really just challenging you to, this morning to decide at the close of this message to, to get up here and go after God or whether you're there or whatever. But to go, I mean go after God with your heart. To seek, to hunger, to thirst. That's what we need. We need God. Sometimes we think, well, I need a break or I need help, or I need a change of responsibility. And that may be genuine. It might be a possibility. But your greatest need is to connect with God, to have an ongoing feeling of the Holy Spirit of God flowing through you and out to others. It's between you and God. Ask yourself this question between you and God. Am I really filled with God's Holy Spirit? I didn't ask you if you ever spoke with the spiritual language. I ask you or now, right now, are you full of God in his Holy Spirit? I'm inviting you to take time and seek and thirst and hunger for all of God and his spirit. The next thing to overcome dryness is ask Jesus to fill you with his spirit. John 7, 37 says this, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. In John 4, he told the woman at the well, he said, I have water for you to drink. You'll never thirst again. That's Jesus. It's, and he mentions the, the Holy Spirit like a living river flowing up out of the belly right like this. Christ Jesus will just fill you up and flow through you by his spirit. Ask God to make you thirsty. 
Ask God to make you thirsty. Anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. Just simple prayer. God, make me thirsty. The psalmist said again as a prayer, Psalm 42, 1 and 2, as the deer pants for the water, for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you. My God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Is that your prayer? When can I go and meet with God? Musicians, will you come? Have you asked Jesus to fill you with his spirit? Have you determined that you want to fill yourself and your family with all of who God is, with his word, with his love, his truth? The last thought I have is to overcome dryness is don't delay, start today. Don't delay. This is it right here. Now, go after God. A common response to spiritual dryness is you put off seeking God for some future time when it's more convenient. Or perhaps you're thinking, when this busy season is over, I will have time to spend with God. Or maybe you're thinking, it's almost time for lunch. Or you might be thinking, good, pastor's letting us out early. Look at this. He's just said the musicians to come. We can beat the Baptist to the restaurant. It won't make you any more eternally secure. Or perhaps that was meant as humor, not theology. Or perhaps you're waiting for God to suddenly toss you into the river and just refresh you whether you want it or not. It doesn't work like that. God's a gentleman. He says, come to me. God told us to, that he's standing at the door knocking. If we'll open the door, he will come in. He's seeking. He's saying, come. Come unto me, all you the weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Come, take my yoke upon me. Learn of me. My burden is light. Come. Come to the door. We... You can sup with me and I with you. We will have communion. We will walk together. We will live together. Go after God today. If you don't have a day, take an hour. If you don't have an hour, go after God in the shower in the morning. In fact, listen to me. God spoke this to me today. This, you've never heard this from a preacher ever. The most important thing about walking with God is not just the times that you make alone with God. Now, Jesus did it. Listen, remember, he went away up into the hillside and he was alone with God. He stayed up all night with his father at times in prayer. Those times are important. But he had a whole lot more times when he was living his life, being led of the Spirit, walking through a crowd, being moved, turned this way, that way, and he was with his father all the time. And faith is as easy as breathing. So in the shower in the morning, you got what? I mean, some of you need to stay a little longer, but you got a little while in there, right? You have a little while. Pray and worship. Search my heart, God. Worship me. Then when you get in your car and you're headed off to work, pray in the car. Keep your eyes open. That's where the scripture watch and pray comes in, but pray in the car. And turn off secular stuff and put on God's stuff because that music like King David would minister with his instrument and voice, that music will minister to you. You have a party with Jesus in your car. See, it, you can do this, okay? You can do this. Make time for Bible study. Say, well, I don't have time for Bible study. Let me tell you something. Pastor Hawkins is a tremendous orator of God's Word and teacher. Last week, what a message. He does that during Sunday school every week right here, and we have other people good too. I was so thrilled as I went back into the area where the young adults are, two big classes of younger adults studying God's Word. Thank you. Be a part. Jump in. Do it. Go after God today. You can be refreshed leaving here. And listen to me. Your courage to align yourself with God's priorities and make it a priority to seek Him, to hunger after Him, to thirst after Him will encourage others to do the same. So as we stand together, let's everyone, please hear me. Let's go after God and let's do it right now.